All right, I have an email here about some questions on eternal security, and uh, this prompted this sermon. I, I uh, had this brother write to me and uh, keep the names private, but uh, he asked me some questions on eternal security, and I said, hey, you really brought up some good points here. Would you mind if I made this into a video sermon? So that's what this is going to be. I'm going to read the email here. He says, hi, Brian. I sent this to you through YouTube, but I thought that I would send it to this address as well. Thank you for doing what you are doing. It is becoming harder and harder these days to find someone that teaches what the Bible says and not what they want it to say. And uh, that's going to become very true in this study today. Um, I'm going to teach you what the Bible says, and you're going to have to come to your own conclusions on this thing. All right, there's the authority, not here. But anyways... Um, I have been watching your videos for some time and have learned a great deal from you. I recently watched your sermon on eternal security, which changed my mind on the subject. Your sermon has cleared up most of the questions on the subject that I had, but there are a handful of verses that I'm struggling with, and I was hoping that you can shed some light on them. And I will certainly try. The first one is Luke chapter 24, verse 47. And we're going to begin reading in verse 46. Luke 24, verse uh, 46. Now let me just say before we get started, so you know where I'm going with this whole sermon. Um, I believe in eternal security for right now in this time that many would call the church age. And of course that's kind of a loose term there. You can, you know, it's not really a scriptural term, um, but it's the time where after... Uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, where the gospel is preached from then up until the rapture, till the catching away of the body of Christ. That's what I would call the church age. I don't really have a better term than that for it right now. But the point is, I do believe in eternal security for this time period, all right, with two possible exceptions to that rule. And these two exceptions are nothing that have to do with the flesh sinning, living in sin, things like that. The two possible exceptions are spiritual in nature. And only God is able to judge when somebody crosses that line. And we're going to be looking at that later on as we continue. But if you have a Christian that's sinning, that's, that's in fornication or drunkenness or, or whatever, profanity or things like that, um, those things will not have you kicked out of the body of Christ. All right, And you're going to see... What they'll do, what they will do is they watch, when you sin, you will get out of fellowship with the Lord. All right, so you're going to see most of these questions, um, it's about a Christian falling out of fellowship with the Lord, not about them losing salvation. So keep that in mind as we go through this study. Luke chapter 24, verse 46, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Okay? Now I'll read his question here. The question is, is this talking about being saved or repenting after being saved? Okay? In other words, you know, is repentance a thing that you have to do to keep saved, to stay saved, and if you don't repent, then you lose your salvation. Well, in this context, what it's talking about is salvation. And I'm going to show you that. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. And you know, notice there too, this is after the crucifixion, when the Lord is saying, go on out and preach to the, to the people. Okay, so He's giving them their commission to go out and preach. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. What are they preaching there? It says here, Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see there the two aspects, two of the aspects of salvation. Repentance toward God. You come to Him as a sinner. Give up your self-righteousness. There's no possible way that you can get into heaven by your own good works. So there's repentance there. And then there's faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, and you say, well, that's two different things. Two different things, but it's, a, it's the same event. So, it's not Lordship Salvation teaches that you have to repent and change your life, and then God later grants you salvation. That is heresy. 
Okay, that's not what I teach. That's not what true biblical salvation is. True biblical salvation is that you give up your self-righteousness. You, you come to God in a broken state and you say, I am a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. You know, that's what's going on here. So, it's not that you have to continue in repentance to stay saved. That's what, not what's going on there in Luke chapter 24. It is a passage about salvation. Okay? So that was the first one. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll show you something else here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be hitting a lot of scripture today. I'm going to try not to bunny trail. It's kind of difficult for me. You know, try to try to stick to the subject at hand here. You know, it's not always easy. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 28 through 32. It says here, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. There's one of the strongest passages on the subject of eternal security. Okay? Verse 29 talks about these people eating and drinking damnation to themselves. Now, damnation in this passage is not talking about somebody going to hell. How do you know that? Verse 32, that we should not be condemned with the world. See? So it's not talking about that damnation there. It's not talking about you going to hell, losing your salvation and going to hell. What it's talking about is, you ever hear somebody that say that their whole life has fallen apart, and it's like, man, I'm just going through hell on earth right now. You can be damned in the sense of your life falling apart because you are living in sin. That's what's going on there. And notice verse 30, it says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. As a sinning Christian, you can actually have your health affected, you can have your testimony, your joy, you know, a lot of things affected. And if you don't come out of it, God can actually kill you early. Pretty bad. That's what's going on there when it says many sleep. All right. You say, well, how do I, how do I stay in fellowship with the Lord? Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. God has given you standards in this book right here that you judge yourself. Okay, we're going to be seeing some of that today as in this study. Things like drunkenness and fornication and covetousness and idolatry, stuff like that. You read through the Bible, you realize I'm doing these things I'm going to get judged for it. Right? Clean it up. Okay? God's given you the instruction manual of how you're to live your life. And if you get convicted by this book, then you clean it up on your own. You clean up your own life. Get it out of your life. Otherwise, if you don't, God's going to have to come after you and judge you. And He'll get it out of your life. See? You are given the responsibility of self-judgment, of repentance. Repentance means that you're changing your life you're you're turning okay things are changing the bible says about in second corinthians 5 17 one of the big verses i quote a lot if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new all right those sins of your past you get rid of those things you get you give those up when you get saved all right and then you continue in sanctification cleaning up your life so that you can get a, a stay in fellowship with the Lord. And if you start to sin, you start to mess around with sin, you don't lose your salvation. You read about there, verse 32, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, the Lord will punish you if you are sinning. That we should not be condemned with the world. You don't lose your salvation if you're messing around with the flesh. All right? Get that thing figured out. Now go to the next one, Romans chapter 8, verse 13. This is the next question. Romans 8, verse 13. You're going to see the tie in here. Remember it said in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, it said about many sleep. Look at this, verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Okay? 
Here's what he wrote about that. Read the email here. He says here, is this talking about being lost versus saved or repentance after you have been saved? Okay, what it's talking about is keeping your life clean and judging yourself, judging those sins so that you don't have to be judged of God. Okay, that's what it's talking about there. And you say, well, could you give me some practical applications? Sure. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Go on out and start drinking. Drink a beer. Drink two beers. Drink a six-pack. Uh, throw in a little bit of vodka, a little bit of uh, whiskey, a little Jack Daniels, a little, you know. What happens to you? You live after the flesh, you die. If you drink enough, you'll get cirrhosis of the liver, you'll be in a car accident, you'll have all kinds of other problems. Drunkenness is a sin. I'll give you another example. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Go on out and fornicate with a bunch of prostitutes. Guess what you're going to get? You're going to get some kind of a sexually transmitted disease. You lived after the flesh, therefore you're going to die. Simple as that. You go down through the list of all the fleshly diseases, or all the fleshly sins, rather, they are diseases too, but uh, you go down through the list, they will all lead to your early premature death. That's what's going on here. But you see, if you're self-judging and you get rid of those things and you say, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. And it doesn't mean you do it and then you say, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. And then you go back and do it again. And you say, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, the Lord will see you right through that. He'll see that you're just faking, okay, and he will judge you at that point. But if you're really truly repentant and saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, and then you quit doing it, God won't judge you. God will actually overlook that a lot of times. Why? Because you judged yourself. So we should not be judged. But if you don't judge yourself, then God judges you, but He does not condemn you by, lose, by taking away your salvation. Okay? Very important to understand that. Romans chapter 7. I'm going to show you some things here. Romans chapter 7, verse 14, we're going to see this nature here. This is, this is the key to the understanding the whole thing of eternal security. Okay, Understanding that there is a war between the flesh and the spirit. Um, and I've said this in other studies, and I'll say it again because it's very important. Man is a tripartite being. Okay, You have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. At salvation, what happens is your soul is redeemed... Say it this way, your soul is redeemed, your spirit is quickened, it's made alive, in other words, the Holy Spirit comes in, moves within your body and begins to teach you, but your body of flesh remains the same. Your flesh is corruptible, okay, that means you are going to get old, you're going to get more wrinkles as time goes by, you're going to get more gray hair as time goes by, you're going to get more pains in your body as time goes by, but it also means that your temptation to sin is always going to be there. And as a saved person, you still have the capability in your sinful flesh to do all the sins that the lost world commits. And you've got to get a hold of that thing. A lot of Christians, they get saved and they think, okay, I'm saved, I'm redeemed, I'm never going to sin again. And what happens is they're going along, they're doing fine, and all of a sudden there's a temptation, they fall for it, and they go, I must not have gotten saved. Well, you know, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But, uh, you know... If you really truly have repented and come to the Lord, you know, and, and you really truly got saved and you were doing good, well, you're probably saved, okay? But you start to mess around with that flesh and you start to sin and things start to fall apart. But you got to understand that that flesh here, your worst enemy is right here, your body, okay? You can get away from devils, you can get away from evil things, you can't get away from your flesh, all right? And it's very important to understand that because that's really the whole issue with eternal security. Understanding the struggle there that's between the flesh and the spirit. Let's see it here. From the greatest Christian that ever lived. Romans chapter 7, beginning of verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh 
Notice he doesn't say in my soul and my spirit. It's in his flesh, his body. Dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Your flesh is the single most deceitful thing out there. All right, I'll give you a couple examples real quick here. Your flesh will cause you to overeat, indulge in gluttony. But then again, your flesh can also cause you to undereat not eat the right kind of food, so you're weak and anemic. Your flesh can cause you to sleep too much. Your flesh can cause you to sleep too little. That's why the Bible says that you're to do all things in moderation. All right? Don't become an overzealous health nut that doesn't ever do anything for the Lord. And all you're trying to do is just perfect the body and exercise and exercise all the time. Bodily exercise profiteth little. Okay? It is profitable, but just don't waste all your time doing it. But then again, don't go out and eat you know, jelly donuts and, and hot dogs and soda pop and, and candy bars. See, there's a balance there, all right? You have to practice moderation, see? But your flesh is always constantly going to be trying to kill you, <laughs> to bring you down. And there are times when you're going to want to read the Bible and you'll find yourself falling asleep. Times when you want to pray and you'll start getting drowsy and you'll start saying weird things and stuff like this. Uh, you know, that's what happens. Why? Because your flesh fights against the Spirit. So when your flesh sins, don't think to yourself, I must have lost my salvation. Oh, no. Uh-uh. It doesn't work like that. If you are saved right now, today, then you are redeemed, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We're going to see those verses later on as we continue. But understand, you're never going to get rid of that struggle between the flesh and the spirit. It's a lifelong fight until you go to, to be with the Lord. That's why Paul wrote and said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he goes on to thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. At the redemption of the purchased possession, known that we call it the rapture, that's when you go and be with the Lord. You receive a new body. Now you're complete. That tripartite man, that tripartite being, now all three parts are now redeemed. All right. Till then, you're going to struggle. It's important to get that. All right. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 18. We'll read this, and again, we'll see this thing, this struggle between flesh and spirit. Okay. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. No condemnation to them uh, to which are in Christ Jesus, okay, who, who are walking in the Spirit there in context. What's going on? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. You see it there? Verse 2, For the law of, of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the, the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's important to remember. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In other words, this stuff doesn't apply to you if you're lost. These verses are only for saved people. Verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. 
But that if, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We're going to come back to that one. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him. Do you suffer when you're fighting with the flesh continually? Uh huh. Continuing, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You see, you will suffer struggling with the flesh, that war between flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit, all the time. And of course, you know, you go out with people and they have no Holy Spirit to guide them, so it's just the flesh totally in control. The lost world out there. And you're not going to fit in with them. Okay? Uh, the Bible talks about friendship with the world is enmity against God. Right? And you saw there the one verse uh, talks about uh, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. See? So if you're a friend of the world, if you get along with the world, then you're the enemy of God. Enmity against God there. But notice here in verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, did you know if you doubt uh, eternal security, if you doubt that, you truly will live in bondage and fear? You say, how so? Well, you know, I was going through the doorway the other day and I banged my head and I said, oh, what the... And a cuss word came out. And I just realized that I lost my salvation when that happened. So I had to fall down on my knees right there and get resaved. And then I got up and I went and I got on the computer and... And I went to log on to my email account and an advertisement came up with a woman with a swimsuit on and I lusted after her and I lost my salvation again. And I greatly feared and I said, God, please, I, I'm sorry, I lost my salvation twice today already. And so I need to get resaved. What a way to live. I mean, how many times, if you were really truly honest about your sin, if you don't believe that you have eternal security, how many times should you be getting resaved every day? What would that be? That would be a life of bondage and fear, wouldn't it? Why? As a Christian, you're going to sin all the time. Not intentionally sometimes. Sometimes it just kind of blindsides you. And you Whoop, I shouldn't have looked at that. And, you know. But hey, if you lose your salvation every time you sin, well, you better get resaved every time. You know, That would be bondage again to fear. No, what we have received is there in verse 15, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You're not going to get kicked out of God's family every time you mess up. All right? Important to understand that. Now go to Romans chapter 11. Here's the next one. Another question that was brought up. Romans chapter 11, verse 19. Now, on the first time I recorded this video, this whole section here got cut out. So, I don't know. Hopefully it won't this time. Romans chapter 11, verse 19. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Um, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Okay, and they also, if they abide not in, not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. All right, let me read the email. So we get the question here. Romans 11, 19, verse 23. My understanding is that being grafted on means that we are saved. It then talks about being broken off because of unbelief. In verse 22, it says, If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Wouldn't this mean that one can lose their salvation? Okay, very good question. Extremely good question. 
And I'm just going to be real honest with you and real straight with you. Um, there are a couple things that I struggle with, and I have been back and forth, and back and forth, and looked at other scriptures and gone over it and prayed about it, and and uh, I come to the conclusion that I'm but a man, and I don't have perfect wisdom and understanding. Now let me give you a couple ways that this thing could be interpreted. Okay. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Well, that could mean that you're cut off from the promises uh, that God gives to the nation of Israel. In other words, they have things that are coming to them in the millennial kingdom and your millennial inheritance that you could have. If you go against the Jewish people, then your millennial inheritance is cut off. The problem with that is it doesn't really fit into the context of this chapter. All right. The other possibility would be if you start to mess around with the nation of Israel where you're not going to be admonished anymore. We're not talking just somebody that starts to fall for replacement theology and then turns away from it. I'm talking somebody that's gone over the edge. They hate the Jewish people. They hate the nation of Israel. They're saying that the true, true Jews are some other kindred of people that lives in America or something ridiculous. And the people in over in Israel are wicked, satanic, whatever's. When you get to that level, you're playing very, very close to God saying, okay, you're cut off. Meaning, somebody that was saved loses their salvation. Not because they were drinking, not because they were fornicating, not because of whatever. Because you're dealing now in a spiritual matter. All right, I'll give you a good example. Martin Luther, the famous reformer. Now, I used to teach that the man was saved. And then it's like I had people sending me stuff and I'm going, wait a second here, I don't think this guy was a Christian. And part of what Martin Luther did is he came out very harshly against the Jewish people. He hated the Jews. See, some things that the Reformers had that they believed in, these guys are former Catholics. Well, and they just kind of, you know, part of the Protestant Reformation thing was they just wanted to reform the Catholic Church. They didn't really want to abolish it. They just wanted to kind of fix it up a little bit. you know. So they took a lot of that Catholic baggage with them to their new system of belief. Catholicism has always been against the nation of Israel, all right, in spite of what they want you to believe. You know, when they're trying to do peace treaties and whatever else, that's just a scam. All right? Catholicism, all they're trying to do with peace treaties is get their foot in the door. Once they're into the room, peace treaties off. Okay, you'll see that in the future with the Antichrist when he makes a peace treaty between the nation of Israel and, and the Arab people. But, subject of another study. But the fact of the matter is, this Martin Luther wrote such hatred, he had such hatred for the Jewish people. And do I believe he was saved? No, I don't. And I think that there's a case there where you could say that when he came to God by faith, you know, sola fide and all the stuff that he came out with, could he have possibly gotten saved at that point in time and later been cut off because of his hatred for the Jewish people? I don't know. That's for God to judge. Okay, I can look at his life and I can say, you know what, somebody writing that against the Jews and never repenting of it, I don't believe is a saved man. But was there ever a case where he was saved and then later he lost it? It was cut. He was cut off. Not he lost it because of messing around with the flesh, but because he got into a spiritual realm where he shouldn't have been. Interesting. But let's get the context here of this. Uh, Romans chapter 11, we'll start at verse 1, and we'll read down through here, uh, just to get in context of what's going on here. Um, is it talking about millennial inheritance, or is it actually talking about the Jewish people, all right, and their salvation, and what's going on here? Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say, then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Let me just stop there for a minute. That's what a lot of these replacement theology people do. Uh, don't you know that the Jews are, are messing around with all these extra writings and things and these satanic things and the Kabbalah and all this other stuff? 
don't you know that the modern nation of Israel has a hexagram for the, their symbol, which is a satanic symbol? And it is. You know, and it was founded by the Rothschilds and all this other stuff. Yeah, all that stuff's true. Okay? The Jews right now are in unbelief. They are wicked as a people. Okay? But look what it says here. Verse 4. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And by the way, if you study it out, both Catholicism and Islam are basically just Baal worship. Islam comes from Catholicism. It's Baal worship is all it is. So what's going on there is, even though most of your modern day Jews are going to submit to the system of Antichrist, there's still going to be a lot of them, ultra-Orthodox Jews and things that are like, I am not going to submit to Catholicism. I'm not going to submit to Islam. No way, not going to happen. Okay? They're not all bad, in other words. Just because the nation is bad. I mean, don't judge Americans because our government is bad. We're not all rotten and corrupt and, and ignorant like our government. But uh, verse 5, Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Notice that one. Okay, Israel as a nation has not received Jesus as their Messiah, but there were some that did. The election there, they did accept Jesus Christ, and the rest of the nation, the ones that don't receive Jesus Christ, those are blinded. Verse 8, according as, it hath, as, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. You know you're rich today if you're a Christian? If you are a Gentile that's saved, you are rich. And why are you rich? Because God chose me as a proud American. No, you're rich today because of Israel. Because of a bunch of, Jew a bunch of Jews that God inspired to write a book. Because of a Jew, a homeless Jew, that was a carpenter that died on a cross for your sins. That's why you're rich. I mean, think about it. We're going to live in a city of gold someday. You know, most of us don't even possess much gold, you know. But there's going to come a day when the city, the streets, where we put our feet is going to be gold. Shouldn't we be happy about what the nation of Israel has done for us? Shouldn't we bless that Jewish people? We sure should. Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. So Paul's not talking about spiritual Jews here. He's talking about physical Jews. Verse 15, For, the, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the, fat, or the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. If you're saved today, and you're a Gentile Christian, don't you dare boast against the nation of Israel. Well, they're in unbelief. They're this, they're that. Yeah, but you wouldn't be saved if it wasn't for them. Your desire should be to see the nation of Israel be blessed by God. Okay? Your desire should be to pray for the peace of Israel. Pray for those Jewish people. That should be what you want. You shouldn't boast yourself against that nation. Verse 19. 
Thou wilt say, then the branches were broken off that I may, might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Well, wait a second. I thought the Bible said that we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. What's going on here? Well, you didn't receive the bondage again to fear because of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. But we're dealing with something else here. Okay? Keep reading. Verse 21. For if, see, it ties in, be not high-minded, but fear... For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. What is a natural branch right now? Okay, it's a Jew, and if that natural branch is cut off, it's a lost Jew. Well, in context, see, it's not talking about millennial inheritance here. It's talking about if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. God goes down to that tree there, the root being Israel coming up through and all those branches and things, these Jewish people, and he says, you don't believe in my son. Snip, 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 snip. And here comes a wild olive tree that's grafted in as a Gentile Christian. And Lord looks down and says, wait a second. Whoa, you're boasting against the root. You're not happy to be part of this tree. You know, the family tree, you know. You're not happy to be part of that thing. Maybe I need to prune you out. Verse 22, Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Okay? Now, if you want a scripture that's a possible exception to the rule of eternal security, I'd say here's one of them. All right? And you say, well, Brian, I think that the cut off there just means cut off from the promises. You don't inherit the millennial kingdom and things like that. Yeah, but the context is talking about salvation. All right. I know it's a problem. I know that, you know, we want to make things hard, fast rules. You know, right now we want to make it, you know, that the Bible is always going to be faith alone, that there's always going to be eternal security. I know the brethren want to do that. They want to just make the Bible, the whole Bible teach the same thing. Everybody's always been saved by faith. There's never been works involved and all this other stuff. But the problem is you're not rightly dividing the word of truth when you do that. All right? And, you know, I've done other studies about that. And, you know, uh, one of the big ones, you know, the thing about justified by faith alone. And they say they were in the Old Testament. How do you know? Abraham. Well, Abraham was in the Old Testament, but he was before the law. So you can't use Abraham to say that he had the same thing as David. You know, David had the sure mercies of David. God had special grace and mercy for him. But what about King Saul? You know, see, there's all these issues, these different things. You know, eternal security. I believe in eternal security from now till eternity. Okay, what do you do about somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble that takes the mark of the beast? Do they have eternal security? Are they sealed under the day of redemption? No. No, they're not. Read Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. See, you can't force the Bible into one system of belief. You can't say, the whole book is for me. It all lines up with the doctrine that I believe for today. you got to be careful about that. But we'll continue on here. Uh, Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to show you another reason why I think that it's a very serious sin to mess with the nation of Israel. And if you know the Bible at all, you probably know where I'm going with this. 
Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, when somebody is cursed of God... Um, usually that means that they're on their way to hell. Okay? And I understand a Christian can get out of fellowship and they can receive to themselves damnation in this life and be weak and sick and sleep, you know, even. But there's a special curse that comes upon people that go against the nation of Israel. All right? You don't want to mess with that nation. You definitely don't. Turn over to Genesis 17. you see here where Abram becomes Abraham. And again, you know, well, this, this, uh, this promise, you know, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. A lot of the replacement theology weirdos will actually teach that the nation of Israel is no more. That they blended with other nations and back there, you know, and now there are no more real Jews anymore. And the nation that's over there is just a satanic creation of the Illuminati and the Rothschilds. Uh, that's ridiculous. I'm going to show you why. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and uh, be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations." Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and, the kings, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations, uh, until the few centuries there where the Jews were dispersed, and now now there's no more anymore. Uh, no, it says, uh, for an everlasting covenant an everlasting covenant that's something that will not be broken okay to be a god unto thee and to thy seed after thee and i will give unto thee and to the, thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of canaan for an everlasting possession and i will be their god so when you have somebody coming out good example stephen anderson he's come out in some of his post trib rapture moment videos, and he attacks the Jewish people, and he says, they're no more, they've been dispersed, they're gone, we are now the Jewish people. Then what are you doing in Arizona? You see, the future prophecies are about a geographic location, the nation of Israel. Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom in Israel, headquartered in Jerusalem. All right? There are promises. There is an everlasting covenant that has been made. So when you have somebody coming out and saying there are no more Jews anymore, it's just spiritual Jews now, they are calling God a liar right to his face. That's very serious. That's extremely serious. And if you had somebody that came to the Lord and they got saved way back when, and then they get away from the Lord and they start to go into spiritual areas where they shouldn't be, and they start to mess around with the nation of Israel, and they won't be corrected, and they start to throw out all this stuff. And like Martin Luther, Martin Luther's books were used by Adolf Hitler to persecute the Jews. That's very, very serious. Extremely serious. And when you get to that level, there's a good possibility that you're going to be losing your salvation, that you're going to be cut off. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll go to the next one here. It's going to be a detailed study today because there's a whole bunch of scriptures that we're going to need to go over because there are a lot of questions here on the thing of eternal security. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 
Okay, it says here, Now you know that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Or know ye not, excuse me. Know ye not that, that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let me read the email. Is this talking about the loss of salvation? He wants to know. No. No, it is not talking about the loss of salvation. You say, how do you know that? Turn over a chapter or two to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If you defile the temple of the Holy Ghost, God destroys you. How does God destroy a sinning Christian? Let's look about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 down through 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. It doesn't say if she's a stepmother or actually a birth mother, but either way it's bad. Verse 2. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, now look at this, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This was a saved man that was doing this. But notice, it wasn't that he was attacking the nation of Israel or boasting himself against the nation of Israel. It was a fleshly sin. It was fornication that this guy was committing. See, very evil, very bad. But you see, this guy was doing it and there was no repentance there. And so... What the Lord does at that point in time is He says, okay, Satan, go ahead, go get him. He doesn't say, hey, Satan, you just step back, all right? Because I'm going to take that Christian, I'm going to send him to hell. I'm going to pull their salvation away from them because they were committing fornication. The Lord doesn't say that. He just says, hey, Satan, uh, he's not repenting. Go down there and get that guy. Do whatever you want to him. And Satan so says, well, you mean I can kill him? Well, he's not repenting, so yeah, go ahead. See? And uh, if you're living in sin, and you're messing around with the flesh, and you're really saved, you don't want Satan coming after you. You're dealing with a being, being that's at least 6,000 years old, and uh, he knows how to kill people. He's had a long history of killing people. And uh, he has very interesting ways of doing it. So you better stay confessed up, because if you don't, and the Lord lets Satan loose on you, you got problems. You know? Big problems. And you say, well, uh, you know, is it a dangerous thing to let somebody like that in the fellowship of Christians? You know, if you know somebody's there and they're doing that, I mean, you have Paul going, I don't even need to be there. Okay? Get rid of the guy. Kick him out. It's very dangerous to have somebody in your fellowship like that. Read here, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. In other words, if a Christian couldn't be around fornicators of the world, or with covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, well, you probably would, wouldn't be able to have a job, and you wouldn't be able to go out shopping, or whatever. <laughs> okay, You're going to be around sinners, in other words. But notice the sinners that you're supposed to avoid. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, a saved professing Christian, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one know not to eat. 
For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? For them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from you among yourselves that wicked person. Get rid of people that are in your fellowship that are messing around in sin. And uh, notice there, you say, what sins sh should we judge? What sins are the kind of things that are dangerous to have around? Well, the things that are listed there, fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner. So you see, six things listed. Interesting number. But you say, what's a railer? Okay. A railer is one who scoffs, insults, censures, or reproaches with opprobrious language. Somebody who is overly offensive and they really have no love within them. Okay, they just offend people for the sake of offending people. They're always argumentative, just a real jerk. Okay, um, you don't want to be like that. First Peter chapter 3, I'll show you a verse about that. First Peter three. First Peter chapter three and verse eight through seventeen. Finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. See it again there? Judging yourself. Self-judgment. If you're living in sin, God has to judge you. Doesn't send you to hell. And doesn't take away your salvation because you're living in sin, because you're living after the flesh. He just says, you're not going to love life. <laughs> Verse 13, And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. See, that's how to have a good life as a Christian. Okay? Don't mess around with the flesh. Don't mess around. Because, see, you know, railing for railing, what is that? Railing for railing is somebody insults you and is a jerk to you. And you react in your flesh and you come right back at them and you act like a jerk right back to them. See, that oftentimes is what they want you to do. And I'll, I'll confess a fault. There have been times that I've done that, right? Sometimes I do a little bit more railing than I should. Sometimes I don't, okay? I'm not saying that you should never kick somebody and call them names and things like that and be a little sarcastic. The Lord Jesus did it. Paul did it. A lot of men in the Bible have done that. There are some times that you have to rebuke people harshly rebuke them sharply all right there there is some of that but try not to do it you know in the flesh don't respond like that out of anger all right and 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 be a railer careful about that now let's go to the next one and here's one of the famous ones a lot of people will turn you to hebrews chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 Okay, Hebrews 10, verse 26 through 29 says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Read the email here. He says, Is this referring to us losing our salvation, or is this talking about after the church age has ended? 
after the church age has ended, definitely, without a doubt. Okay? You say, prove it. All right. I knew you'd ask that, so that's why I said that. How can you prove that this is for after the church age has ended, after the body of Christ has been removed? Let's read it. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. How many people have sinned willfully after they have received the knowledge of the truth? I have. The Apostle Paul did back in Romans chapter 7 that we read earlier. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That evil that I would not, that do I. The good that I would, that do I not. Paul was saying, I'm a sinner. Sinning after he was saved. Willfully sinning. So by that standard, if this was for us today, Paul was lost. And so was every other Christian. See, what's going on here? Is there a sin that you can commit that is automatically going to send you to hell? Yes. In that future time period, known as the time of Jacob's trouble, you can take the mark of the beast and you're damned to an eternity in hell. Guaranteed. Excuse me, guaranteed. 100% guarantee. You take the mark, you go to hell. Just the way it is. But look at verse uh, 29. It says there, Hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath... Oh, sorry. Uh, up farther. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified and holy thing hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. 